When people think about continuous delivery, what are they thinking about? What is coming up in their minds? Well, yeah, right, tools, isn't it? Uh, that's, what, that's what we usually do, and developers like tools. So, first of all, we are figuring out which continuous delivery tool we want to use. So, first option is Jenkins. Well, everybody uses Jenkins. It's an obvious choice. But, well, there are others, um, like GoCD um, or um, Concourse CI or Lambda CD. This is a very interesting option. Um, it's written in Clojure, and your whole pipeline is also written in Clojure. Very cool. Uh, Spinnaker. Um, what do we have? Bamboo or, um, or drone. So, it starts there. Next step. Which version control system? Well, I hope you don't have to figure out this one and that you are already using version control. Otherwise, you are in big trouble. And you should speak to me after the talk. Um, how will I build my, uh, my software? So which tool will I, uh, RM, RM, oh, damn, sorry. Uh, which tool will I use for building the software? Where will I put uh, my artifacts? Um, which testing framework? Um, how will I um, check the quality of my code base? And um, how will I provision my environment? Will I use Docker? So, and then the next step is how will I integrate all those tools to, um, to build this awesome continuous delivery pipeline so I can say that my organization is using continuous delivery. Now, continuous delivery it's not only about tools. Well, yes, tools are important. You need the tools to have the pipeline. But the tools is not the goal on itself. It's a mindset. It's, um, it's a set of principles and practices that you need to adopt. So the goal of continuous delivery is um, to sustainably minimize your lead time to create positive business impact. Um, lead time is the clock time from I have an idea until this idea is implemented in the hands of the users and used by real users in your production environment. This is lead time. And business impact is everything that um, creates money for your company. This is your turnover. Um, saves money for your company. This is reducing cost. And protects money for your, uh, for your company. This is um, being ahead of your competition. And you want to create positive business impact, not a negative one. Um, anyone knows the story of Knight Capital? No? Okay, Knight Capital was a uh, trading services company which managed to lose 460 millions of dollars in 45 minutes and went bankrupt, of course. Why? because they had a, a shitty deploy process and a, a bad implementation of feature toggles. And what happened is they had one application that had to be installed on eight servers, and they forgot, they simply forgot to install it on one of the eight servers. And that server went crazy, resulting in losing $460 million in 45 minutes. So that you don't want. You want positive business impact. And you want to do that sustainably. So you don't want to beat the shit out of your team. That will work once, eventually twice, but the third time they are gone. Now, how do we get to um, sustainably reduce this lead time? So, one thing I like to use is um, to apply the principle of the three ways from um, the book The Phoenix Project. Anyone know this book? Yeah. Well, the other ones, it's a really nice read. Um, my colleague said you can read it in one weekend if you don't have kids. <laughs> it took me a, a bit more time, but it's really nice to read. It's, it's a novel about an enterprise IT organization, um, which of course has, is in big trouble um, with one project that is really important for the, um, for the organization and which they managed to turn into a success by applying the lean principles and adopting uh, the DevOps culture. Now in this book they speak about the principle of the three ways, which is um, 
and, and easy and um, guiding principles to improve your software delivery process. Um, the first way is about um, maximizing the flow of your software delivery process. It emphasizes the throughput from um, your business to your development, your testers, and your operations until your, your customers. So it puts the emphasis on having an effective software delivery process. So the purpose is that you are going faster. And why would you like to go faster? Because you want fast feedback from your customers. And that's the only way that you can learn faster and that you can improve faster and so that you can be ahead of your competition. Now, to go faster, you need to have a repeatable and reliable software delivery process. This means you need to have a deterministic build, test, deploy and release process. That is item potent. This means that um, if you are going through this software delivery process on and on and on and on, you always end up in the same state. If you are installing a specific version of your application in production once, or you install it twice, um, three times, 1,000 times, you always end in the same state without any side effects. So you don't have suddenly a new component that is installed because you installed the application for the second time. Um, now, the only way to have a repeatable and reliable process is automation. Um, and um, there's very little that you cannot automate. Um, so, well, you have your build process, um, you can automate the creation of your database schemas, the migrations of your database schemas, um, configuration of your network can be automated, configuration of your environment, etc., etc. The only thing you cannot automate is manual exploratory tests. For that, you need the creativity of your testers. Um, next, everything needs to be under version control. So everything you need to build, to test, to deploy, to release, needs to be under version control. So of course, your code, your test code, uh, your build scripts, your uh, network configuration, your application configuration, environment configuration, um, schema definitions, uh, schema migrations, everything needs to be under version control. So, clearly automation and um, version control will improve your throughput and the reliability of your system. Um, reliability, because you are able to reproduce a production environment um, when something went wrong from a known good state and um, uh, throughput because um, you are able to um, recreate environments on a self-service basis. Who of you needs to wait two weeks, three weeks to have a test environment to test a bug? Well, only two of you. Great. <laughs> Super. Um, so, and this tooling is important, but tooling is not enough. To improve your throughput, you need to improve your collaboration. So you need to align everybody that is involved in your software delivery process on the same goal. And this goal is to deliver um, business impact in the shortest amount of time. Now, in my opinion, the only way to get to that is um, to create an empowered product team. So it's bringing everybody involved in your software delivery process um, into one product team. So this is your product manager, your UX designers, your, um, your developers, your testers, um, your operations, um, security, and they need to be empowered. So they need to have um, the permission to figure out whatever is necessary to create business impact for the value stream that they are responsible for. So the value stream being everything you do from I have an idea until this idea is implemented. Now why will this improve throughput? Well, because you are limiting uh, communication channels and you are limiting dependencies. Remember the keynote of James, uh, James Shaw? Limiting dependencies will improve your throughput. 
you don't have to wait for other teams until they are ready to, uh, for, for you to do something. To improve throughput, you need to also to aim for single piece flow. So this means that your um, entire team as a whole is working on one feature at a time. And whenever the feature is finished, you install it right away into production. Whenever you find it fit for production and it passes all your tests, put it into production. Don't wait till the end of your sprint. Don't batch your features and install features um, in batches into production. This also means that your definition of done is not when development is done working, it's when your feature is in production and used by real users. This is the only way that you can know that a feature is really implemented and finished and it's your only measure of progression. Bigger batches will lead to bigger lead times and so slower time to market. Uh, bigger batches means also uh, bigger work in progress and work in progress is whenever you are working on multiple features at a time you, you are creating work in progress. Uh, whenever you are waiting until the end of the sprint to install features into production you are creating work in progress and work in progress is just inventory and inventory is money that is stuck into your system. This is money that, you, that doesn't generate any income and it's money that you cannot spend for um, implementing other features or investing in other products. So, aiming for a single piece flow will improve your, um, your throughput and will also improve your financial situation of your company. Uh, smaller batches will also reduce risks or bigger batches create more risk. Why? Well, if um, you are deploying frequently into production, well, um, you are practicing your deploy uh, process over and over and over again. And so you are able to detect very early if there are problems and you can fix these problems very early. Um, second, if you are deploying frequently into production, you are pushing smaller changes into production. So, and whenever something went wrong, after that you installed a new version into production, it will be far more easy to find the root cause of this problem than when you have just pushed six months of changes into production. Well, chances are that um, if you have pushed six months of changes into production and you find a problem that you will have to roll back. Um, and lastly, well, rolling back small changes is far more easy than rolling back six months of changes. Well, from a technical perspective, because um, lesser components are involved, and from a business perspective, it's far more easy to um, convince someone to um, roll back a small change than um, to roll back 20 big changes that took you six to one year to implement. If your continuous delivery process is really effective, well, you can even roll forward the fixes that you, uh, that you need to put into production. So you, you just commit a patch into version control and you roll forward and you release into production, which will even more reduce your risk because you are using the same process to fix problems in production as you do to deploy new releases into production. Rolling back is an exceptional process that you are not executing that often. So you, don't, you are not always very sure if it will work. Um, your application should always be in a releasable state. So at any given point in time, you must be able to install your application into production, even if you have unfinished work. So it's okay to install an application with unfinished stories into production. So this means that ready for release doesn't necessarily mean that you need to install into production. It is an option that you have. Continuous delivery doesn't impose you to uh, release frequently. It only imposes you that you have your application in a releasable state on mainline at any given point in time. Um, as said, it is um, totally acceptable to release unfinished work. So um, in traditional agile, we have this idea that 
all stories, all bugs, needs to be finished at the end of the sprint. And as a result, we tend to stop development by the end of the iteration to uh, prepare the software for release. In continuous delivery, we don't prepare for release. The software is always releasable. And um, every build is a potential release candidate. Um, so every commit is a potential release candidate. This is specifically a problem in the Java community because of Maven. Um, Maven introduced this concept of having snapshot and release builds. Now, um, having this, these concepts tend to split your development process into stages. The development that produces snapshots build and the release that produces the release build. Now, this is in conflict with a principle of continuous delivery that you should only build your binaries once. Once it is built, you just promote it from one stage to the other in your pipeline. So once, it is, uh, once you have the binaries, then you go through your acceptance test, you go through your performance test, uh, your scaling test, your uh, manual exploratory test, and when you find it fit for production, you move it to production. So you don't rebuild your binaries between each stages. Now, how do you keep your application always in a releasable state on mainline? Mainline being master or trink of your version control system. While well, you apply, um, okay, you apply trink-based development. Trink-based development is this practice where every developer commits um, on mainline at least once a day. And, well, this, this is the theory. Um, in my opinion, it should be at least once an hour. Um, so you grow your features on mainline, not in long-lived feature branches. Um, not using long-lived feature branches will prevent you from painful integration uh, uh, processes when you have to merge these long-lived feature branches into, uh, into master. It will also prevent you from big refactorings that break everything. Um, now, how to apply trunk-based development? Well, first of all, you have to split up big changes into a um, sequence of small incremental changes. That's first. Second, um, you hide unfinished work. So, um, it's perfectly possible to have unfinished features in production um, that is publicly accessible for your users, but that your users cannot discover because they are sitting behind a URL that is not discoverable. Um, if you want to make big refactorings, um, you should apply branch by abstraction instead of branching by, uh, by source control. Branch by abstraction is a technique where um, if you want, for instance, replace a library by a new one, well, you will introduce um, an interface in front, of your, uh, in front of your library. You will abstract away the library using an interface. And then you will gradually replace all code passes that use um, the library di uh, directly by using this interface. And once you have done that, you can replace um, gradually this library by the new library. This also means that um, it's perfectly possible that you have, at a certain point in time, your application using both libraries and being installed into production. This is a temporary solution um, that will then disappear over time. And lastly, as a last result, you can use feature toggles. Um, you will um, use feature toggles when you want to hide features that are publicly visible in the UI or when you want to replace um, an existing algorithm by a new algorithm, but you are not sure about its performance and you want to test it with a small set of users in production. So, feature branches should be, uh, um, uh, feature toggles should be used as a last resort because it adds complexity to your code base. And it also makes testing uh, a little bit more complex because you have to test um, uh, your code base with, the, with the, the toggle on and off. Include um, using um, feature branches is uh, doing agile. Applying continuous delivery with um, trink-based development is being agile.
So it really forces you to be agile. The second way is about introducing uh, feedback loops at all stages of your, um, uh, of your software delivery process. This is about improving feedback, preventing that problems are happening again, making sure that problems are detected early and fixed immediately. To improve feedback, you have to stop your production line whenever something um, or whenever a problem occurs. You stop your pipeline whenever a problem occurs, you find the root cause and you fix it immediately. Don't create a defect in your defect tracking system. A defect tracking system is just a queue of partially done work and partially done work is waste. Um, so, if your build breaks, Stop committing code. Um, if you continue committing code, it becomes harder and harder to find the root cause of, of the broken build. And you end up in a situation where your build will be constantly broken. And as a result, your development will slow down because you don't have monitoring of the health of your application. And in the end, you end up with an application that is not releasable, which is not helping your throughput. To improve feedback, you also have to build quality into your code and not test it in later. From a quality perspective, you have two kinds of inspections. You have inspections that um, happen after the defect occurred, and you have the inspections that prevent you from having defects. Well, if you want to build quality in, you have to um, prevent the defects. And this requires discipline. Um, this requires applying techniques like um, test-driven development and acceptance test-driven development or behavior-driven development. Um, it seems to be that there are two terms for behavior-driven development. Uh, so the idea is that you, you don't start implementing features as long as there is not an automated acceptance test. So you start with the automated acceptance test and then you start growing the feature until the automated acceptance test is green. And during that you implement the, um, uh, the feature, you use test-driven development to grow your design. Now, this leads to two conclusions. Um, testing is not a phase. It is part of your development process. Oh, dear. Five minutes. Shit. Uh, pardon. Um, it's part of your development process. And... Um, so it's not something that happens at the end of your development. If it happens at the end of your development, you are too late. Because what, happens, what will you do when you, have, when you find a defect? You don't have time to fix it. So um, what, uh, what happens is that you then create a, um, a, um, a defect in your defect tracking system, and so you create partially non-work. And everybody is responsible for, your, um, uh, for the quality. This is not only the responsibility of your testers, it's the responsibility of everybody. Now, to make testing part of your development process, apply continuous uh, testing. Go away from the test ice cream cone, where you have very little uh, automated unit tests and acceptance tests, and you have lots of manual regression tests. Manual regression tests is a very bad thing. Humans are very bad at re repetitive dump work. Um, and it's not really motivating for testers. You should adopt the test pyramid, where you have lots of unit tests and lots of acceptance tests, and a little bit of um, automated end-to-end -end tests. And by the time that you arrive at the manual exploratory tests, well, you should have a pretty good confidence on the quality of your code because of all those automated tests. And as a side note, your end-to-end -end tests um, are really smoke tests that are run in, in production right after the, uh, the time that you have installed um, a new release into production, but before you have uh, made it available to your, uh, to your users. So we make this distinction between deploying, which is the fact of installing a feature, and releasing, which is the fact of um, making, it, making it available to the users. So. Continuous delivery works because it has this crazy focus on quality. And quality is not only code quality, it is business quality. Is, um, um, does the feature meet the expectations of the users? It's uh, performance quality, it's uh, operational quality, does the application run, does it scale, is it secure enough? 
The third way um, is about um, creating a culture of improvement. Uh, being aware that um, experimentation and risk taking will uh, lead to improvement and that repetition and practice leads to mastery. Um, you need this improvement because your pipeline will not come over one night. This is something that will incrementally grow. Don't start automating like you're crazy. Um, have retrospectives with everybody involved in your software delivery process. Make sure that also uh, non-technical people are present and discuss your software delivery process and see how you can improve it. Now, it's very hard to have this discussion with non-technical people like UX designers and product developers, um, uh, product managers. Now, one effective way that can help this discussion is using your value stream map. The value stream map is um, every t uh, so it's, it's this drawing about your value stream. It shows all the steps you need to get from I have an idea until this idea is, is in the hands of the users. And then you can identify waste and identify bottlenecks. Um, it's very important to, uh, to identify your bottlenecks because spending time optimizing anything, then, you, or, or, then your bottleneck is a waste of time. Um, well, if B is the, is the bottleneck, trying to optimize A will only lead to create more work for B. So it will pile up work in progress in front of B. Um, optimizing C will also not help because, well, C is working at the same rate as B. It cannot go faster. Um, repetition and practice leads to mastery. So if it hurts, do it more often. Um, if integration is painful, well, comment on mainline. Have a CI. Um, make sure that your features grow on, um, um, on mainline from the start of your project. If testing is, is difficult, well, apply continuous testing. Do it right from the start. Don't wait until the end of your development. Um, if releasing is hard, aim to release um, on every commit. Now, this is a vision. You don't have to have that from the start, but you, but you should have this vision and, and, and go in that direction. Use your retrospectives to get there. Um, so if it hurts, do it more often. You can also apply that on your, in, in your personal life. Um, <laughs> I, I've coached a team and the manager said to me, um, well, I don't like uh, public speaking. And the manager said to me, well, <laughs> Thierry, um, well, you always say to us, if it hurts, do it more often. Why don't you apply that to you? And so I started doing uh, talks and uh, in conferences. So to conclude, optimizing for throughput and for speed will lead you to lower cost and a higher quality. Where in the past, we tried to optimize for quality and cost and we got neither. Now, to get there, you have to have in place the right improvement system. You have to be able to improve continually and to improve fast and learn fast. And as a last, um, continuous delivery is not, not easy and not cheap. Uh, it's really a, a, a mindset you, that you need to, to adopt. Now, from an agile perspective, if you uh, consider an agile transformation, Pick immediately continuous delivery because it forces you to, uh, to adopt the technical practices that makes Agile work. And yes, you will write a lot more code than you usually do, but you will do a lot less firefighting. Thank you for your time. So I'm Thierry Depot.